Let's learn Musette by J.S. Bach. I'll play it to you first of all. So this is a very beautiful piece. It's full of joy and cheerfulness. Uh, a musette is a type of bagpipe, um, particularly in France, and it gets its name from that bagpipe uh, because it's imitated in the music. This piece was actually the gavotte in G major from Bach's um, English suite for keyboard, BWV 808. So you could listen to it in its original um, form. It's uh, obviously in a different key because this is in D major that we play it in. The overall effect, as I said, is of cheerfulness and joy and there's a great deal of um, poise in this music and the articulation between the phrases is needed for a successful execution of this dance. Articulation is an interesting word. Um, it comes from the Latin articulare and it's a verb that means to join. So it's all about how we join notes. And we're going to look at that a little bit later on in this video. But first of all, what we're going to do is look at certain aspects of the piece. First of all, the warm up. What could you do as a warm up? Well, be creative with your warm ups. I like to do an improvised warm up of D major. So I know that uh, there's a certain rhythmic pattern in this piece that goes long, short, short, or ta, tete, ta, tete. So I'm gonna use that pattern and I'm gonna apply it in this little improvisation. I'm gonna play the scale, I'll go up, I'll go down, I'll just do whatever comes into my mind as I play it. So we have. <laughs> important to get away from just always playing what's written in the, the music but try to have this sense of being an improviser as well and we can develop that right from the earliest stages you have to remember that in this day the baroque period the composer wasn't just a composer he was a composer performer improviser and that's what Bach was that's what Beethoven was they were all like that so that's a little scale we could use as a warm up with an improvisation. We could also do a scale which uses broken thirds because there's a little section in it where we have these appoggiatura figures which goes, they're drops of a third. So um, I could play a scale that goes, I could make up that or I could do it. Do 
whatever you want. It could be all separate bows, you know. Whatever takes your fancy. So be creative with your warm-ups and connect them into the techniques that you hear and see in the piece. And you can explore how you're going to play something in the piece musically through the scale itself. You might notice that with this ta tete ta tete rhythm, the first notes, the crotchets or ta notes, they get a pull and a push of the bow. And that's an interesting concept because now we're beginning to really think about how we apply the bow to the string to get the sounds that we want. We're trying to be clear in the narrative that we use when we play a piece of music. This is an important concept. Bach was at the end of the Baroque period. He's a late Baroque composer and his death in 1750 signifies the end of the Baroque period as we think of it. But the Baroque period had been going on for many years before him and you know at least a hundred years where we have people like Monteverdi and the key to Monteverdi was one of the things that he said was prima le parole, first come the words. So we can see that words were important to compose in those days and the meaning of the words. So we're constructing basically a musical narrative when we play a piece of music. And this is an important thing to understand because um, it has an em emphasis in how we create dynamics in music. So for instance, in this piece, we have the end of one of the phrase goes, which is, loud then soft. That's something that the voice and that these musical instruments like strings and winds can do. We can say loud soft. So my name, Hector, is loud soft. Keyboard players can't do that. They can do long short. Hector. Da da. But we've got a special way of being able to speak the words. Um, so when we're practicing that, we can actually do a little practice of that with a scale that goes like. It has a very pretty sort of yearning quality. And that's prevalent in this piece all the way through. So um, we've done a little warm up. I'm also gonna do a little tonalization because I want to become more aware of how I make sound on the instrument. A simplified way of looking at it is this. There are three parts or components to sound. One of those components is your point of contact between your bridge and your fingerboard. Another component is the pressure of the bow into the string. And the other one is the speed of the bow that we use. So when I look at the point of contact, I can simplify that further by thinking of it in terms of five lanes, like in a bowling alley. So lane one is on the bridge, lane two is near the bridge, lane three is in the middle, lane four is near the fingerboard, and lane five is the fingerboard. And I can explore sound in these areas. I'm gonna just keep the bow on these points of contact, and I'm gonna see what do I need to do, or how does it feel to create the most resonance in the string. How do I get the string to ring to its maximum or to shake, vibrate? So if I play three on the A string, I'm just gonna do a series of bows. Now I'm looking at the string and I'm watching it vibrate and I'm trying to get it to vibrate to its maximum. So I'm gonna try and apply a little bit more pressure, a bit less pressure, and always using a fast bow speed. So I'm getting the combination between the fast bow speed and the pressure that creates the biggest ring in the strings. Now I'm going to move the bow slightly nearer to the finger to the bridge. So I'm in lane four and I'm going to see what's different about this. So now I can apply a little bit more pressure into the strings. Now I'm going to go into lane three and see what happens. So I'm going to apply a bit less pressure. Now just a little bit more. Now a 
a bit more. And I noticed that as I applied too much pressure, the string stopped vibrating as much. And when I came away with the pressure a little bit, then it started to vibrate more. But when I'm using such a fast bow, I always need a certain amount of pressure to be able to get the string to vibrate. And the thing is that when you're in lane five, the string is at less tension than as I move towards lane one. So obviously I'm gonna need a little bit more pressure, maybe a slower bow speed to get the string to vibrate as I go into the greater the tension of the string. So I'm getting used to all this feeling in my fingers. And this is an important thing that I'm starting to engage with the feel of relating what the action is to what the sound is that I'm trying to create. Now that's particularly important in this piece because when we look at a piece of music, it's basically this groups of notes um, and how we shape this group of notes allows us to create longer phrases. So what we're asking ourselves is how do we connect little groups of notes? And this idea of connection, of joining, is what articulation is from. So it's how do we join notes? So for instance, if I have arthritis of my elbow, it's an inflammation of the joint between my lower and upper arm. So how am I gonna connect these notes? Well, first of all, I'm gonna simplify it and find a group of notes that makes the basic melody. So in this particular piece, a group of notes that makes a very basic melody would be the crotchets. So it goes like this. The next bit would go. So there's a very lovely melody, and I'll play it again to you so you can hear what it sounds like. So A, A, F sharp, one on the E, three open, three on the A, three on the A, one on E, three, low two. So now I've got a melody that goes up, it comes down. It goes up and then it comes down again. It has this curvy line, which is the line of grace and elegance. Now, once I've got that, I can add a little bit of connecting material or decoration. So I could play the next, the first note of each of the tete notes. So it goes. So I've just added a little bit of the connecting notes. And now I go to the next stage, which is adding the last bit, exactly what's written in the music. So we have this, now it connects, now it connects. Now I breathe. The last bit's a very good example of that connection where we have four notes, each note uniquely different from the previous. No two notes are ever the same. So I've got four notes here which are gonna grow, each one a bit more than the previous. So that that three at the top shines. Three, then less. So we can see how we can connect these notes to make the shapes that we want and make these longer phrases of music. Now in this particular piece, the phrase lengths are very important. So the first phrase is two bars, then the next phrase is two bars, the next phrase is two bars, the next phrase is two bars, the next phrase is four bars, the next phrase is two, and then two. So we have two plus two, two plus two, then we have four, then we have two plus two. Um, now we come to how does that help us when we're actually learning this piece? And this is for me very interesting. So when I'm learning this piece of music, there are two aspects. It's not the most technically demanding piece that I played. It has slurs, but it's the shaping of the notes. It's also the string crossing is a real problem in here. So I'm going to look at each phrase and let's say I call this particular group of notes A. So this is A. Now, I'm gonna look at the bowing on its own. So it's gonna go A, A, D, A. 
and I'm looking at my strings so that first bow that I push I want the strings to really open up in their vibration and I'm doing that through the speed of the bow it's the speed of the bow that makes the strings vibrate it's not the pressure but I need enough pressure to make the bow not skim on the surface of the string so I'll try that again And now I'm going to put the fingers into that. So it goes A, one on the A, three on the D, open A. So we call that little group of notes A. Now I'm going to go from the last note that I just played, which is again an open A, and I'm going to call this next group of notes B. And they sound like... So I'm going to look at that from the point of view of what does my bow have to do. So it's going to go A, A, E, E, go. And I'll do that again. And I'm trying to think of how I'm going to connect these two main notes there together. So. And now I'm going to put the fingers into it. So it's A, three on the A on its own, open E, one on the E. That's better. Okay, so that's B. Now I'm going to do the next one, which is C. So it's one on the E string, it's a push bow, so it's an up bow. So I'll do that again for you, so one. So this one with the bow is going to be E, E, A, A, A. I'll do that again. Right, now we put the fingers into that. So one on the E. And you'll see that I have that sighing figure, or almost like we call it an appoggiatura figure here, which is my name, Hector. So more strong, weak, or loud, soft. And I'm doing it through the bow. It's that combination of pressure to speed and then the release on the second note. So tension and then resolve, releases. So I've got A, B, C. The next stage is to put A to B. So I go... The next stage is to do B to C. Then after I've done those combinations of joining these two groups, I'm going to put A, B, C together now. So. Because I have the raw melody kind of in my head still, this. I have a real sense of where I'm trying to go, the direction I'm trying to take these words. This musical narrative has a real shape to it. So when I have the decoration, I fit the decoration into that musical narrative to support it and to, to join it all together. That's articulation. So I've given an example of what I would do in learning this piece in the first two bars of the piece. Little blocks, little groups, and then putting those groups together, um, little by little. If you think about it, um, the piece itself is um, 16 bars. I think it's about 16 bars. So when you're practicing, you don't have to learn the whole piece all in the first practice session. You can take little sections. If in the first practice session you've managed to learn the first two bars, brilliant. If you imagine that you're having a lesson from one week to the next, if you're doing two bars each day, and let's say you practice for six days, and you've learned 12 bars in those six days. So you can get through that piece that way. If you learn four bars in one session, then you will have actually got through this whole piece in four days. So. Think of it 
as a long-term project. Don't always think I've got to do everything all at once, but plan your practice so you know exactly what you're doing. Now, I wanted to have a look at the very end of this piece. Um, it has a lovely effect. Um, there's a lovely article about what romantic composers were striving for, and it went something like, um, a musical tone fading into the distance was the ultimate romantic image, for as the tone becomes physically inaudible, the human imagination might continue that tone on into infinity, the realm of the spiritual. I love to hear this ending having that sort of effect. Um, so the end, I'm going to play it just the notes, uh, the main notes. It's going... And then away. And then there's a little joining decoration, which is... Two, three, A. So we have the main note, then the decoration, and then it fades away into the spiritual distance. Now I'm going to practice it just separate bows. And that allows me to actually work at the shape that I want to hear. Once I've got that really comfortable, I'm going to add the slurs. And I'll do it stop slurs first of all, because this is a slur of four notes. So I have to save my bow a little bit. So one on the E, and it's a push bow, so it's an up bow. One on the E. Now let's see if I can get more shape to it. And now I'm going to try and do the same thing, but with the smooth slurs. Now you might notice that I'm using very little bow and I'm in the upper half of the bow here. I'm not using my whole bow. No, I'm not doing that. Um, partly because it's fading away to nothing, but also because um, there's a, a concept or an idea in Baroque times called chiaroscuro, which is this idea of um, light and shade. And it's a really important concept. Um, you can see it in the paintings. It's basically, it's like a dark painting with a shaft of light that comes through the painting and it illuminates somebody's face. Um, it's full of mystery and intrigue because you look at the characters that are in the darkness or in the shade and you wonder what, what are they thinking, what are they, what part do they play within this painting? What's it trying to tell us? Um, so in the section before what I've just played, we had this figure. Which was quite bright and joyful. And this is the calming down. So we have the light, then the shade. The concepts are so interesting to me. I just think Baroque music is so fascinating in the way that they create this talking music, this narrative, and the way that they think the violin can actually express this idea perfectly easily. So those are uh, most of the points in this piece. In the third line, I find the third line is quite hard. So the first thing that I would do is learn the notes first of all. So I have this. So those are the notes of that third line, which are, are quite tricky. The first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to look at the ending of that, which has a slur of four notes. It goes... So if I go there again, I put one, open one, two, three, four, and it's an up bow, and it's going to go loud, then getting soft. Remember, four notes are never the same. You've got to do something with every note. No two notes are the same. So it's going to be loud then getting soft. I could do that with stop slurs to practice. 
The useful thing about stop slurs is it shows you how you're dividing your bow. What you're not wanting to do is quarter, 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 because then you're going to get the same sounds. So we've got to do a little bit more, a bit less, but still less, least. And then we get the effect we want. So now I do it smooth. And then I'm going to look at the bit that started all of that, which went... Um, And that's quite tricky for the bowing because it has the string crossing idea again. These are little string crossings, which I'm just using my fingers to nibble over to the new string level. So I'm not using big arm movements. So we have E, E, A, E, E, A, E. So E, E, A, E, E, A, E. So I'm just using my wrist and fingers to cross over the strings. And I'm thinking about the levels. We've talked about it before. Think, don't think of levels as being E level, A, D, but think of it E, E minus, A plus, A, A minus, A, A plus, E minus, E. And think of the levels in that way. So we're moving. Now I'm moving over to E minus, A plus, E minus, E minus going to A plus E. So I'm kind of in between strings. I'm, I'm exploring this area where I'm almost playing on two strings that the movement's very, very small. Um, so then I just put my fingers into that. So E, one, three on the A, low two on the E. This is a little bit tricky, but we've seen this before, or this technique before, when we were playing um, scales like G major arpeggios and things like this, that basically, I'm going to play the one on the E, but I'm going to leave it down when I play the three on the A, and then I can put the two right beside it. So that one stayed down on the E string when I played three on the A. It didn't move, so I had a guide for the low two. So E, one, three on A, low two, then one on the E, three on the A, and this time I use it as the guide for a four, which is a step away. So I'm using fingers and the relationship across the strings to help me. Um, and now we get to the, uh, what I think is the, the tricky bit, which is this. Now, it starts up bow. It starts with a push bow, actually. But first of all, I'm just going to play the notes. So we've got four, then low two. Three, one. 2-1, then E3, 3 and A, then E1, low 2, 1, E, 3 and A, 2, 3. Now there is a pattern here, but this is a, a pattern of appoggiaturas. So we have this yearning quality like, yadam, badam, badam but they're not all the same. So I personally play the first one louder and then I get less with each of the three. So I have, these are my thirds, which I practice in my scale, but it goes four, two, three, one. So each one was slightly less than the previous. Then I get two separate bows, E, three on the A. And now this one, I actually crescendo through them. So I start with less, but more bow. So remember the pattern of slur, 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 separate. Slur, 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 separate. So three slurs, two separate notes. Three slurs, two separate notes. Just remember the pattern, get used to it. It's Another example of actually a place where I tend to get rid of the bow and the violin and just practice that little line with the tune in my inner ear and I'm just doing the actions in the air. So I have and that way I can actually start to control the movements of my arm. Remember that everything that you say, 
on the violin is a projection of energy. Your arm is just a projector of an energy. Everything that we do in life is a projection of energy. If we get angry, we, we go bright red in the face, we tense the muscles. If we want to embrace someone or we're open, we open our arms like this. These are projections of energy. So this is a projection of energy which you can actually explore without the violin and bow. So yum. Now that's an exaggeration of the movements. So the mechanical movements are quite free, so I can feel them in a free way. Now when I play the violin, that freedom that I've just felt without the bow and the violin comes into the playing of the instrument. So you have much much better and then I just want to say one other thing was that the end of the second line we have this figure which goes um, now there are multiple ways of being able to play this or, or shaping this phrase but one key element is when you have the same figure twice in a row you're not gonna play it the same way twice in a row. That would be very, very odd and boring. Um, you know, you don't say, I love you, I love you. You might say, I love you. I love you. Or you might say, I love you. I love you. But whatever you're doing, there's a difference between these two words. If you're gonna say something twice, there has to be a difference. So you could start soft. Then go more. Then a bit less. So you can create this beautiful curving line again. Um, if you can create the serpentine line, which is the line of beauty, then all that's even better. Um, so you could also do it slightly more, then less, then even less. It's infinite in the variety of ways that you can express it. Interestingly, there is a, um, not in the original manuscript, but in the music that you have for the Suzuki repertoire, it puts dynamics into it. But remember that, Dynamics are emotions. They're not loud and soft. Loud and soft is a relative term. Um, my parents are very elderly. I could be speaking to them like this. They wouldn't hear a thing. But I feel I'm speaking quite loudly. It's relative to how good your hearing is. It's like fast and slow. It's a relative thing. I'm sure I, if I ran against Usain Bolt that he would win by miles. It's not that I'm not trying my hardest or running as fast as I could. I feel I'm running fast, but it's relative. So it's the same thing here. Think of dynamics as being a mood or an emotion. And within that, it goes up and down. It doesn't stay flat. It's not a Kansas wheat field. So we try, I, I probably would do soft and then more, then less, then go again. So it would go like that. Um, I hope you enjoy playing this piece. It's an absolutely beautiful piece. Um, and it's more complex than it. It seems simple, but it's not simple because it's all about how we articulate the words that we're trying to put across. Whenever you play the violin, you're trying to tell a musical story. And that's what this piece is all about. <laughs>